Um, the subject I was going to discuss with you now, I didn't really know. So, what did you want it to be again? Anything in particular? Okay. So, so continuation of Brisbane t chat of what happened when you, what happens when you die. This part, this part of it, I, I started talking about it in Brisbane. Uh, Um, you could say this is the intro part. What, I, what I'm going to do, actually, it's not part of the Human Soul series of talks. We're going to call this a series of talks that I haven't given to you yet called Spirit Life. All right, so. And this is the beginning of, uh, of those talks. I'll just find myself another different colour. One that's a bit more colourful. Hmm. All right. Um, what I want to do is uh, do a series of talks with you about firstly the process of passing and then the process of what happens when you arrive in the spirit world and what kind of things you may uh, find yourself involved with there. And then uh, I would like to go through a discussion of what the hells are like and what the first sphere is like, what summer land is like, and then what the second sphere is like, and the third sphere, and the fourth sphere, and the fifth sphere, and the sixth sphere, and by the time we get to the sixth sphere, it's going to be fairly hard for you to imagine. And then we'll talk, discuss the seventh sphere, and what it's like in the atonement condition, or the eighth sphere. And I want to do, and as I go on in my own progression, I'll get better at explaining some of those things as well to you. So uh, I'll hopefully I'll just keep on doing that until we get to the 22nd. <laughs> yeah. but, but from the 7th from the seventh sphere to the 22nd, it's far better demonstrated to you than actually um, talk about it. So, so hopefully by that stage, I'm in the stage where I can demonstrate those things to you. So uh, that's a, a long-term plan, shall we say. It might take a few years to uh, give you these talks in total. But we'll start off with this one, uh, this first, the first one in the series, which is what happens when you die. And the re one of the things I would like to do is, some of you are quite mediumistic, right? And you're going to get prompted with a lot of questions from the spirit world during these talks. And one of the main reasons why that is the case is because many spirits, even though they have passed, still don't know what happened. I don't mean that they don't know what happened when the, the, that they're dead, but they don't know what happened and why it happened and where they are now, why they are, where they are now, and any of those questions. I've never had them answered their entire life in the spirit world. And some of them have been in these places for thousands of years and never had those questions answered. So many of you who are mediumistic will have some strange questions prompted to you from, your, from spirit people. And uh, my suggestion is to overcome your own fears and put up your hand so you, and give them a voice in this discussion. Because uh, one of the main reasons why I would like to discuss this subject is that the majority of people on this planet and the majority of people still in the spirit world in the hills face one common fear, one common terror. And that is, even though we don't like to admit it to ourselves or others, and particularly when we become spiritual, we don't like to admit it to ourselves or others. But we're actually quite afraid of death. And many of you feel you're not. But when you actually start discussing it, you'll start feeling some of the fears rise within you about what actually does happen. You see, there are many false concepts of what happens when you die. Many of these false concepts have come about through different things that people have described. For example, some people have experienced the, the, the process of, uh, of a near-death experience. In other words, they've had a process where they've almost died, they've almost passed, but the physical and spirit bodies have not yet disconnected from each other. The, what's called the silver cord has not snapped. And so they have this metaphysical experience, which is a real experience uh, that their spirit body has that they remember. And many of those experiences are very pleasant in nature. Some, some aren't, but many are. 
and it gives many a false impression of what life's going to be when they've passed. And uh, we've also, in the last weekend, uh, Brian had a number of spirits come to him and ask the question, well, they had an out-of-body, they had a near-death experience when they are on earth before they passed. They thought because of that experience they would pass into a really lovely place. And then when they actually passed, they did pass into a really lovely place for the first few weeks. And then what happened is they realised how they looked after that and then they went to their real location in the spirit world, which was in a much darker position than what they imagined. And there was a lot of fear about that and a lot of sorrow that they were experiencing about that that they questioned us about last weekend. So what we want to do is make sure that as many of us as possible on the planet and preferably in the end everyone on the planet understands what happens when you die and really understands, here understands what's happening when you die. Because if we understood what happened then our life might be very different in the choices that we make now, actually. For many of us, that would be the case. Because for many of us, the instant we die, we realise that almost all of our pursuits that we have on Earth are actually quite unimportant. You think about how much of your life is spent with material pursuits. Like, you know, getting a car, getting a house, paying for them. Um, you know, getting the kids off to school and you going off to work. How much of your time is spent working? A lot of times in a job you don't even like. Right? Now, why do we do all of those things? Well, a lot of times we do all of those things because in reality we're afraid to actually have our life and live our life in a manner that's harmonious with love of self and love of others. And what we do instead is we make a lot of negative choices which impact upon our soul condition, which also impact upon our life in, this, in the life we live, but then also impact upon our future life when we pass. And we don't realise how much what our life now, how our life now impacts upon our future life. So the first thing we need to understand when it comes to what happens when we die is... Of course, many of, most of us by now in these discussions, if you've come to these talks before, you would realise that you are a soul and these two things, the spirit body and the physical body, are just appendages of your soul. So this body is just an appendage of the soul that envelops it. So in fact, we could draw it in this way. Here's our spirit body. Our soul envelops our spirit body. And then, and maybe I should draw it a different colour, here's our big-headed uh, male again in his spirit form. Right? So we see we've got a spirit body and a material body, but I've drawn them over here so that we can see them separate from each other. But these bodies are just that. They are not the real our, us at all. They are only a reflection of the real soul condition, what is going on inside of the soul. Now, so it's our emotions. What else? Our passions, desires. Yeah. You know, it's amazing how we ream all this stuff off, but we don't honour our soul. How many times do you not honour your emotions in a single day? How many times do you not honour your passion in a day? So it's one thing, isn't it, to ream off what is our soul and go, oh, it's our emotions, our passions, our desires, our intentions and all those things, right? Quite another to actually start feeling, this is who I am. I am this person who has this conglomeration of emotions, passions, intentions, desires, but also, what else? We also have beliefs, experiences, and all of these things become the sum total of what is within our soul. And our bodies are really superfluous, in, except they are the method in which we collect these experiences. They are the method in which we can experience the universe that we're growing up in. So, while we're here on the earth, we are in the nursery of the soul. So, so as long as you keep in mind while we're here on the earth that we're really just babies learning how to walk, that's really what we're doing here, you'll be fine. As soon as you forget that you're a baby learning how to walk and you think you're all grown up and adult, 
from then on you're not going to be so fine because you'll start being more self-reliant then, right? But if we remember that we're just children just growing up here and when we enter the spirit world you could say uh, it's like entering grade one. For a lot of people that's what it's like. And then, then they go through their spirit world life and they start growing up and they grow to a fully mature adult, shall we call it, which may take for many of them thousands of years. And we get to the stage where our soul even changes and our soul eventually unifies with a, the other half of itself in that 20-second sphere location. So, so there's a huge amount of growth that we need to make. And here we are in this spirit body and material body and it doesn't matter whether we're a spirit right now or we're in the physical body right now. It doesn't matter. The same principles apply that those two things are not the real self. That is the real self. And the real self has a collection of beliefs, emotions, passions, desires, longings and those, the collection of those things we've called and I've told you about called the soul condition and it's very very important to understand the soul condition because it's the soul condition that determines exactly what happens when you die and afterwards it's the soul condition that determines everything because all of God's laws are fixed and unmovable the only thing that can change is your own condition and therefore your own interaction with all of God's laws. So, so when my condition is of a lower desire of love or a lower state of love, I'll have a totally different experience than if my condition is in a higher state of love. And if my condition is a heightened state of fear and terror, then I'll have a totally different experience when I pass over than if my condition is in a lower state of fear and terror. And if I know what's going to happen when I pass in the spirit world, obviously that's going to be a lot easier on me when I pass than if I don't know what's going to happen. Obviously the experience is going to be vastly different. So it's my emotions, passions, intentions, desires, belief, in other words, all of my soul condition that determines what happens when I die. That's it, really. Now, for some of you, some of us will have, oh, well, that's fine. That's great. Oh, I think that's a great idea. That means I've got total control of what happens when I die. Well, it's not quite like that, unfortunately, because your soul condition is as God measures it. It's not the condition that we imagine ourselves to be in right. this is very different because we can easily imagine ourselves to be in one condition but actually be in a very very vastly different condition and if it's our real soul condition as God measures our soul condition and in other words as the soul condition reflects love from God's perspective and not from our own that determines what happens after our passing then it's very, very important for us, if we really want to invest in our future, as the saying would go, for us to understand what love is and, and what, how we can actually develop that condition. There was an illustration I gave in the first century where a man, a man continually built more and more things. He, what he did was he ripped down his old storehouses of grain and he built bigger ones and stuffed them full of wheat and all the other things that he, he needed and animals and so forth. And then he, they wasn't big enough for him so he teared all, tore all that down and built some bigger ones. And you know, many of us in our lives are doing that in a way right now. Not very many of us want to move from a four, four, from a two bedroom, be, a, a bedroom place back to a little tin hut. We want to go from the tin hut to the two bedroom place to the three bedroom place to the four bedroom place to the mansion in the end. That's the general gist of many of our desires, right? In other words, we want many of our desires to be material in nature and we want them to expand, right? We want them to grow. We want more enjoyment from our personal life. But what I said to, uh, in the first century was, you don't know the time that you're going to die. One of the reasons why you don't know the time 
is because there are so many soul-determining factors that determine when you're going to die. Now, if you're at one with God, you never have to die at all. Right? That's also a truth. So, so you don't have to die, but often there are external events that do finish up causing your passing, just like it did in my first century life. So sooner or later you will probably pass. And you don't necessarily know when you're going to pass. You might have a few days' notice and sometimes a few weeks' notice, and, but you don't generally know when you're going to pass. So it would make sense then to find out as much as possible about what's going to happen when you pass right now, would it not? Because if you don't find out now, when are you going to find out? Well, only probably after you pass. And it's going to be a lot harder then to find out the truth about what happens than it is to find out now. And there's a lot of reasons why that's the case, which we'll explain. <coughs> so here we are. Here's our soul condition. And our soul condition actually creates our own death. I'll say that again. The time of your passing and what happens when you pass and how you pass and why you pass that way is all controlled by your soul condition. So can you see if you change your soul condition you can also change what will be happening when you pass and what will be happening what the when and the why and the where and all those things will change as your soul condition changes. Now the reason why spirits in the spirit world can predict to people on earth to a large degree of accuracy when they are going to pass is because most of us are not changing our soul condition very much. And when our soul condition becomes very stagnant without there being much of a change, that means that our life then, and therefore a future life, becomes very predictable. Can you see that? So if you imagine for a moment, here's the progress of time, and here's our soul condition in a positive direction. Here's, say, neutral with regard to love, and there's negative in regard to love. And our, if our condition, say, let's say we, we incarnate on the planet, we're bombarded with a lot of our mum and dad's emotions right at that moment. A lot of their unhealed fears and their unhealed terrors and all of their unhealed emotions get bombarded. And so what happens, we start off in our life maybe quite down there with regard to our condition of love. And we may, over a period of time, slowly grow, but then there might be some things that happen in our lives that cause us to get really down and negative and maybe even quite angry and... And so we go downhill a bit and then we return that corner and we come up a bit. But for many of us what happens is we are not even yet in a neutral place with regard to love, let alone positive, by the time we finish up passing. Now all of that condition of what happened to us creates these experiences and the beliefs and desires and emotions that are retained in our soul and it's that condition that creates the timing and the location of our passing. Does that make sense to everyone? Is there any questions you'd like to ask about it so far? Jen? We have the... um, there's a group of souls with me that feel that their life experiences um, have cause a feeling of victimisation in that they feel a limitation, limited, um, that they weren't able to accept or experience um, more And that determined where they now are, and it's not a place of light. Yep. Well, the truth is, after we pass, we can still continue. So, if that's the time of passing here, we can still continue towards love even after we've passed. And many people, when they pass, don't realize that. Can you imagine for a moment if you were living, say, you were sort of a religious person in, the, in a Christian faith. 
and you're taught that if you're a good person, you go to hell. Oh, other way around. <laughs> if you're a good person, you go to heaven, and if you're a bad person, you go to hell. And what defines what is good? Well, it's what generally your church defines as good. And then what's defined as what is bad is what your church generally defines as bad. Or if we're more ba based on Bible beliefs, what the Bible defines as good and what the Bible defines as bad. So, so let's say um, you were on earth and you, with all of your heart, were practising what the Bible said was good. That was your life, which is where these spirits are, right? So that, that feeling, what the Bible says is, was the right thing and I wanted to practice that, I want to practice that. They tried their best to practice that given the circumstances they were in. And then all of a sudden you pass. And where you pass to, you didn't know at the time, but was actually a reflection of your soul condition and not what you did. Not, although what you did was a part of your soul condition. But it's everything of what you did, your de desires and beliefs and everything. So let's say one of the strongly held desires in this Christian faith, or one of the strongly held beliefs in this Christian faith, was that everyone who's not of your faith is condemned. Now that's a lot of judgment, right? And your soul has a certain emotion about this judgment. And actually the judgment is not actually a loving emotion. And actually I alluded to that in the first century when I talked about judgment being a damaging emotion but many people they read the bible and they go yeah judgment damage emotion. i skip over that i don't judge you know it's only that you're condemned to death but uh, that's all right uh, i'll just continue read you know there's no there's no personal reflection of what's being said even in the scriptures half the time do you know what i mean with regard to what's being said so what happens is they pass over and imagine for a moment all of your life on earth was dedicated to a life of christianity let's say you pass over and because of the emotions you held on to, you passed into the hills. What emotions would you feel? Well, the very first emotion generally is rage. Rage at... Well, firstly, generally it's aimed at God and me. God and Jesus. It's generally aimed at first. Right? Um, thinking that somehow God and Jesus taught them inaccuracies. But that's not true. If they read what I said in the scripture, what I did actually say, and they listened to what I did actually say, I never taught them an inaccuracy about it. In fact, I actually alluded to that when I talked about an illustration called The Rich Man and Lazarus, where the rich man who thought he was good on earth passed over and he passed into the hills, and the man that he was mistreating on earth, he passed into the heavens. And I've alluded to this all the way through in, in the teachings in the first century. And so if they read the Bible differently, they would see that these teachings that we're now getting taught were, have been taught for 2,000 years. But what they have a tendency of doing is not reading all of that with personal reflection. Because nobody wants to admit that their own soul condition needs work generally. In other words, they don't want to look in the mirror and look at how they really look. And the problem when you pass is that when you look in the mirror, you're going to find out how your soul really looks. And a lot of times it ain't that pretty. It's often very scary. In fact, a group of spirits came to us uh, last week and described how different it was to what they were expecting. So imagine, and we talked about this last week, imagine if I don't know my soul condition right now and I pass over, what happens is my soul condition within a very short period of weeks will be exposed to me. I'll come to see what my true condition really is. And my true condition will be as God measured it or as God's laws measured it and not how I believe it to be. So many of those spirits, Jen, uh, they're having it measured by what, what they believe it to be when they passed and then when they passed... Now they had it measured by what God knows it is. How, how can my own sense of good be so used against me? Well, the only way that... Is that the question they're asking? Well, the only way that can happen is by our own sense of good being flawed. 
and this is what this is the problem is that for many of us and I've said this over and over again in these presentations one of the best things you can do for yourself is to see yourself accurately to see your true condition accurately no matter how scary it looks no matter how bad it looks one of the best things you can do for yourself is to see it accurately to see yourself as you truly are right? and when you see yourself as you truly are no one can hoodwink you about your condition no one can convince you that your condition is better than it is nor can they convince you that condition is worse than it is once you allow yourself to see yourself and the beauty of doing that while you're on earth is that you will not be forced into doing it um, or it won't be a scary experience I should say when you pass so for many of these spirits with the agenda they, they have not seen themselves accurately on earth you either <laughs> is that what you're saying <laughs> yeah and this is a truth that for most of us we we all have the same thing where we want to see ourselves as better than we are or sometimes some of us want to see us as ourselves as worse than we are but we're not very good at seeing ourselves as we really are and it's as we really are that makes up our soul condition as God sees it and that condition in love will draw us to the place in the spirit world where we belong in the end but what happens when we pass is this the instant we pass and remember I've spoken already that the time of our passing the location of our passing and the way in which we pass is all determined by a whole series of law of attraction events based around our own soul condition and of course the soul condition of everyone else around us is it also affecting that experience for example if all of you were in a perfect loving state that does not guarantee that you're not going to die it actually doesn't even guarantee you're going to die not going to die tomorrow and the reason why that is is that usually a person's in a group in a, a large group of people in a loving state often then attract other people attacking them who are in an unloving state and can you see here on earth the people who are in a loving state can easily influence the people on an unloving state in the sense and then this is the only sense in that we can a person in an unloving state can harm a person in a loving state by choosing to harm them by choosing to hurt them physically or by even killing them so for that reason just because we are in a one minute condition with God it doesn't mean that we might not die but of course there would be no pain in the process in that state does that make sense no emotional pain in particular in that state so here we are in this soul condition we have a soul condition and the soul condition remember creates the time the place and the circumstances of our passing and and our you can see how much these things can experience can affect that for instance you know my belief systems for example can greatly affect the circumstances of my passing I'll give you an example just this is a very simple example but it just demonstrates the point if I believe that I shouldn't get any medical assistance when I'm ill now for some of us some of us had that belief in the past haven't we of I don't want anything unnatural entering my body I don't want doctors touching my body I don't we could have lots of different beliefs right surrounding that one belief system that we don't want to have anything unnatural touch our body and so we, something might happen like we may have an accident and because we don't want anything unnatural that we think touching our body we actually make a series of choices that end up in our own death so you can see how our soul condition automatically affects our passing and um, of course I'm bringing all of these situations in fact without considering God in the process right which most people don't do let's face it most people don't do it when they're nearly dying they generally don't consider God in the passing with the exception of one moment and that is just before they die they want absolution of all of their sins generally even if they're not religious and that's often the case so our time and place and circumstance of our passing are totally determined by our soul condition and not just our own soul condition but also the condition of our environment that influences the process too so when I pass generally 
There, there may be all sorts of experiences that happen when I pass because my soul condition determines not only the time, place and circumstances of my passing, but it will all determine my experience in the state of my spirit body when I'm no longer having my physical body with me. It will determine that as well. But generally, we can discuss a few points generally of what happens. One of the first things that happens is we arrive like in the spirit world and we don't generally see ourselves very much. Well, let's face it, like you can look at your body, can't you? But I don't know about you, but I can't see my own backside very easily. <laughs> Nor my own back for that matter, unless I've got a mirror, right? And most of us can't see our own face. We don't have eyes that pop out and turn around and look at it. Oh, yeah, that's what our face looks like. We're looking outwards. So, so there's a lot of our body we can't see, isn't there? And it's the same when you're past. When you're past, you still have a body, a spirit body, and you're looking out of your eyes, of your spirit body's eyes, and you still have hands and you still have feet and you still have a body that looks very similar in a lot of ways. But when you start to examine it, you start seeing cracks and fissures and different problems in your body just like you had when you're on earth you have physical problems with your body right your back might be sore and your shoulder might be bung you know and you can't get it above you you know and there's all these different things going on with your physical body and same goes with your spirit body your spirit body is just a reflection of the soul's condition so anyway i arrive in the spirit world and generally i arrive in the place through the, through the mists, which is actually described in the book Through the Mists, um, if you want to read that, from Robert James Lees. Anyway, I arrive in that location, often uh, in a stunned condition, if it was a sudden passing. So if I have a sudden passing, I arrive there and I go, oh, wow, this is different. Uh, I wonder if I'm in a dream, I don't really know. And there's all this stuff that I don't really know right at that moment. I feel a bit disoriented. Wouldn't you feel disoriented? You imagine you're driving along in your car and you see this other car coming for you and you close your eyes, right, because it's just about to hit you. And then you open your eyes and you're not in the car anymore. And, and wouldn't that feel quite strange? Like a, that instant reaction of change would feel quite strange to, to anybody, particularly if you're in a car accident or something like that. You see the car coming towards you, bang, it happens, and you're straight away in the spirit world, you've been severed from your body. And what's, what actually happens physically as you're passing is your physical body, which is connected to your spirit body via what's, what's called a cord. The spirits call it, call it a silver cord. It's actually a, a long stream of energy that goes from your tailbone to the top of your thalamus in your brain. And right from there to there, the cord follows this whole place. It's elastic in nature. In other words, it stretches and moves and it can stretch all the way through your experience in the sleep state in the spirit world. And that cord remains connect, can, keeps your bodies connected with their interfaces of all of their physiological and emotional functions. So in other words, every emotion passes through that cord and every physical experience and every hurt and all those things, pains, and, but all the pleasures also, all pass through that cord into your spirit body and then through a cord that connects your spirit body to the soul and therefore passes into your soul. And so these cords, connecting your bodies together, <coughs> pass information to your soul, you could say. You know, we could liken it to a robot, this physical body, being controlled by the soul and everything the robot feels in terms of the touch and taste and smells and all those things the robot feels gets passed through this cord to the next body's experience and eventually to the soul because the soul retains all of those experiences from the moment that you incarnated right the way through your entire life. So there you have, you have this sum total of experiences that are entering the soul from the bodies and what happens when you die, physically what happens is this silver cord breaks. That's all that happens. In other words, this body, the physical body now, can no longer assimilate information and pass that information through to the soul because it's no longer connected to the soul itself. 
Does that make sense to everyone? It's no longer connected to the soul, so therefore no information can pass. So from that moment on, the physical body begins a process of natural decay. So you try five days after in the sun. A bit smelly by then. Doesn't take long for your physical body to... You bury your physical body without any wrapping or anything like that. And within a few months, the physical body will mostly be gone. And mostly it's just certain bones that will be left after that time. And even those, after a certain period of time, will disappear as well. Generally getting eaten by the different things and by the different environmental factors slowly decaying. Because the energy that the physical body needs to stay alive doesn't just come from food, it comes from the soul's connection. So you can try feeding a physical body that is not connected to a soul, if you want, but it's still going to decay. You, know, you pump it full of food, but it's not going to work very well because it's the soul that controls how the body, the physical body, actually even processes all of its food. The soul controls everything. So what happens is that silver cord breaks and at the moment of that breaking you are surrounded or even before the moment of it breaking you are surrounded by a group of spirits that help you through the process generally help you through the process of moving from where you are now on the earth into assimilating your life in the spirit world. But, but the problem is that their assistance can only be given when you allow the assistance to be given. Now, for many people who pass, they have no belief system whatsoever of any afterlife at all. So you imagine what it's like for them when they pass. They pass, they're still awake, still alive, and they realise they're still alive, they can still see everything. Everything's very different, though. And then there's some people around them who are willing to talk to them, but I don't want to listen to them. Like, I don't know who I can trust here. And straight away I start setting up some dynamics, some emotional dynamics, because of my emotional condition. I start not trusting people and therefore, how can these people now give me information? It's going to be very, very difficult. So for some people when they pass, they pass and they have the ability to receive information, but they reject that. And they go straight away back to what they were invested in in their life on earth. And what are most of us invested in really? Most of us are invested in our family and our property, are we not? The other two things generally we're invested in. Sometimes we're invested in our religious background or racial background and some other things. But generally we have a personal investment in our family and our property. And so what are you going to be attracted to when you pass? Your family on earth and your property on earth. So you will sit there watching your family destroy your property. <laughs> I created that. What are you doing? What are you doing? You know? Why don't you know you have all these project you have all these emotions coming up. And what these emotions need to come up because these are things that you invested in when you're alive on earth. And and you shouldn't have invested in them because they're all pointless to invest, invest in and we should have been investing in other things and because of that there are going to be negative emotions we need to feel about all of these investments. Does that make sense? Would you like to have a mic up the back there? Thanks, Sue. I'm just wondering, um, somebody who's kept on life support, what, is their soul still in their body? Are they still there? Or? Yeah, yeah. If a person's on life support, what is happening is the body is being kept alive uh, artificially so, but the, the silver cord remains connected to the soul. And as a result of that, many people who have stayed on life support for many years have actually just stayed in state or connected to their body. They live most of their life like in a sleep state type experience, but uh, still connected to their body on earth. And the majority of them want that to be the case, because that's part of their law of attraction. The reason why they want that is they're too afraid to enter the spirit world. So, they so could they make, can they make a sole decision to leave? Yes. And despite being on life support? Yes. Okay. And their body will die. Oh. Yep. And they'll separate. Same goes with many de dementia patients. We were talking about this last week. 
many people with dementia are actually living a lot of their life in this state where they're totally afraid of their own emotion, totally afraid of what's going to happen in the spirit world. They want to retain a connection with their body to keep the body alive, but they don't want to be conscious of their own emotional state, so they go out of body. And it's just like this constant state of sort of like an almost suspended animation state, but they're still having experiences in their sleep state experience, but uh, they don't want to pass because they're too afraid of passing. Yeah. It's, it's the fear of passing, actually, that causes most of our distress at the times just before passing. Right? And many people have huge fears of passing. And if we're a person who is conscious of this, we could sit down with our... Let's say our parent is, has dementia and we go to visit them every week or whatever it is. They don't know us. Uh, it seems like they're somebody else. And a lot of times, by the way, they are. They're often spirit overcloaked in this state where they're trying to get out of their emotion. And, we, and when, we, when, we, when they go to sleep, we could just sit there and say, Mum or Dad, you know, you're just afraid of dying. <laughs> you're afraid of dying. And you're afraid of living too. That's why you're in this place. Right? You're afraid of knowing all of your own emotions, so you don't want to know that. And that's what's closed down your brain. That's what's closed down your cognitive experience. But on top of that, you're afraid of passing as well. You don't want to pass either. And all you're doing is creating all of this out of your fear. We can sit down and talk to them about that. If we've had a person in our family in a coma for many, many years, we can do the same thing. Ask them to make the choice. Do you want to be back here again or do you want to leave? What, which, which one is it that you want? Because most of them are too afraid to make the decision. Right? And we need to help them through the process. They don't have to fear the spirit life, but they don't have to really fear life here either. And we need to help them through that experience. If we go, Rachel, and then across to... When my nan died, she died in the night. And in the morning, I touched her, and I, there was kind of like electricity. You know, I felt in her body. What, hmm. what, what's that? What was that? Um, a lot of spirits stay around their body um, for some time. And a lot of them, and I feel your nan did the same thing. She stayed around her body. Uh, they do that because they're afraid to move away from their body, actually, and go somewhere else. And so they often try and attempt to get back into their body. There, if you read the pageant messages, there are a couple of times where you'll see spirits who have experienced that as well. Uh, Mrs. Paget herself, when she passed, tried to get back into her body and hung around her body for some time because she didn't know what to do. She didn't want to listen to anybody else and she didn't know what to do at the moment of passing and she thought she could get back into her body. And so for that reason, many of them actually watched their own burial or their own incineration. And uh, they see their body buried or incinerated and then they realise they must be dead. And then they start asking questions after that. For many people, that's the case. Does that make sense? The energy is coming from... Uh, a so the, the body itself has a lot of uh, stored energy, like a battery, but that energy usually within 12 to 48 hours is gone as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The other question was how... Actually, I wrote it down. How do you look at your own soul condition as God sees you when you've passed? When or, you pass? Or even when you pass, it's really easy. All you need to do is look in the mirror. All right, what about on earth? Well, it, when you're on earth, it's really easy too. All you need to do is look in the mirror. <laughs> that explains why I'm so freaked out when I look in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you look in the mirror, um, you can actually, if you allow yourself to detune from your physical form, you, you can allow yourself to see your own spirit body. And, uh, and therefore you'll see your own condition. I know different ones of you are now starting to practice that, looking at people's spirit body and seeing people's spirit body. How many of you in Mary's courses now have had the experience of seeing somebody else's spirit body who was sitting in front of you? A few of you? Yes, there's a few of people who have had that experience. And the truth is you can see your own spirit body. The truth is also that for the majority of people, they don't want to. Because we're very addicted to what we look at now and we don't want to see ourselves as we truly are. Does that make sense? It's a very powerful thing if you can do it though. Because you'll see how you really are and then you'll know what to do. Yeah. Actually, I had an out-of-body experience where I went to the mirror to look If you look hold the mic up a bit closer. Oh, I had an out-of-body experience where I went to the mirror to look at myself and I, was so, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. 
So just be brave and do it. Because you have to be brave when you pass and do it then anyway. So you might as well get used to it now. Why not get used to it now? Yeah. If we are down to... Yeah. Um, just a question about this example you gave before. Um, if a person has got dementia like, mm. or is in a coma, you said like, to talk to them when they're asleep. Yep. What would happen if you talk to them while they're awake? When they're awake, often what's happening is that they are being overcloaked by another spirit and so you're not going to actually be talking to them. You'll probably be talking to another person. Um, so that, that is frequently what occurs and that's why it feels like they're a totally another person who doesn't really know you as well. Many times it's because they don't actually know you. Um, and uh, when they're in the sleep state, they wouldn't be somewhere else? Like, you know, if you talk to if them? If you have a longing for them to talk to them, generally they'll come to you, yeah. But uh, they may be somewhere else and they may desire not to come to you. But if you have a strong longing, it's pretty hard to avoid a person on earth strong longing when you're in the sleep state or in the spirit world. Yeah. And in fact, that's uh, one of the things I must mention about your grief. When you are grieving a person who passes, and you are not actually, when I say grieving, I'm not actually saying you're experiencing the emotions of grief, but rather you're holding on to the emotions of grief. That is a huge projection at the person who's passed. And when that happens, the person will feel impelled to come to you. There's actually a cord that establishes, an energetic cord that establishes that you can see in the spirit world between the two of you. And so what happens is that this cord that comes out of you, this, this, of this grief, gets projected at the person you're grieving. And, it, and if they're open to it, which most people are, they, they, it, that will enter them. And when they wake up from their sleep, and sometimes when you pass there is a period of sleep, what will happen is they'll wake up and they'll feel automatically drawn to come back to you because you're grieving. And they'll try to convince you to not grieve because they feel they're still alive, right? And, uh, and often it's the grief that causes many people on earth to remain earthbound. It's the grief that you hold within yourself, the people who are surviving them on earth hold within themselves. So my suggestion is to allow yourself to feel that grief fully rather than to project it at the person wanting them back. Because every time you want them back, you're actually stopping them from living their life in the spirit world. They'll feel drawn to come back to you unless they've healed a lot of their emotion. They'll feel drawn to come back to you. And the truth is for most people they haven't healed very much emotion when they pass and so most of them will be heavily drawn to come back to you. Yep. So uh, yeah, with, with, with all of those in dementia, um, sometimes the best time to talk to them is in when they are sleeping rather than when they are awake. Uh, AJ, my mum did pass away from Alzheimer's and one thing, there was two things that I noticed very strongly was one that because of her childhood emotion she was very scared so I realised that she was just trying to hide from her emotions but also um, when she got to, um, towards the end I felt very strongly that she was so scared of the people that she was going to meet when she went into the spirit world, she didn't want to meet her mum again. And I feel like she's with me very strongly at the moment. She was a very private person. I'm feeling quite anxious. And she doesn't want me to tell people about her life. Yeah. Um, but it was very, very apparent what she was going through. And um, the last couple of hours of her life, um, myself and my two sisters bombarded her when Dad walked out of the room and said... Mum, you can go, it's okay, it's safe. Just go with those angels that are around you and they'll look after you because we knew she was so scared to move can I over. Just, can I just correct something though? Yeah. She wasn't seeing angels around her. No, that's what, that's what I felt. Yeah, I know that. She yeah. was just seeing dread, absolute dread. And she was also in her state of dread, attracting fear-based and angry spirits yeah. who were around her. So when she looked around her, she wasn't seeing the angels that you were referring to, mm. which were there, but she couldn't see them. She was instead seeing all the angry and fear-based spirits who were around her. 
Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so when that, you say go to that, she's going, what? Uh, what? Okay. How right. dare you? Know, uh, what, okay. Would you want to go to uh, that? No. No, no, of course not. Okay. That and, must be what I'm feeling. Yeah. yeah. And, and because of the amount of dread that she had in the soul, remember it's her soul condition and her soul emotions that determine her experience after she's passing. Mm. So even and in during, during the passing as well. So if I've got huge amounts of fear of angry people, I'm going to, during my passing experience, attract a group of angry people around me Mm. during the process of passing so that that just heightens the fear doesn't it of yeah. the of the passing and if i'm not willing to experience that fear and shut that down i, I won't want to pass i want to sit on it and sit on it and stay in connected with my body as long as i can and you know mm. and many of them do that is she still in that dread because i'm yeah. feeling it yeah. yeah yeah it's just the other thing too i've had experiences of spirits who have passed over um, coming to me and um, just out of the blue all of a sudden they're there and I just say to them you know go to those spirits well I as you just said about my mum they may be seeing one thing and I'm seeing another totally so so my suggestion how many of you have been using the term go to the light or go to the whatever how many of you have done this in the past can we just have a show of hands here good half of the audience um, it's pretty much pointless saying it um, and the main reason why it's pointless is because it doesn't, it, it betrays the truth of their own condition for a start. Many of them have come to you because they don't see anyone around them and they don't see any light. And when they look at you, they just see that you might know something that might help them. And when you say go to the light, you're not telling them anything really at all, are you? Can you see that? It'll be far better to connect to them emotionally. Like, what am I feeling from you? Oh, I'm feeling like you're feeling a lot of dread. Oh, you're really afraid now. I get, I get it. Well, what I'll do, you sit down with me and I'll describe what the spirit world looks like to you. You know, this is what, this is what it's going to look like. There's this group and there's this group and there's this, these spheres and these dimensions. And you've probably arrived in the first sphere and around you, and again, feel your emotions as you're doing this because they'll impress you emotionally. You feel the emotion. Oh, yeah, so they, the spirits around you are quite dark and you'll feel some really agreement with that. Well, the truth is that there's also some bright ones, but you're not letting yourself see them because you don't trust anybody and you need to trust somebody. Now, what I'm going to do is ask the bright ones to come and show themselves to you and help them make the connection. You see, in every single case, if we desire to help a spirit make the connection between themselves and a spirit who's in a better place than they are to progress, they will be greatly assisted by that connection. But if you just say to them in, in a sort of a flippant way almost, go to the light because you don't know what else to say, what finishes up happening, they're looking around for some light and they're going, what light, what light? All there is here is a bit of darkness. I don't see any light, you know. And, and I can hardly even touch the place I'm in. Sometimes it can be so dark that you can't even see your environment, right? And so you've got a person saying to you, look at the light, look at the light. And all oh, you're hearing their voice, you're hearing their voice. And they're going, look at the light, what light? I don't see no light, what's going on, you know? And then you say, I'll oh, go to these spirits. And what spirits? There's no spirits here. Like, I'm just in this place of terrible darkness and I'm trapped. And, what? and remember, where he or she is, is based around their emotions. So if they had a huge amounts of fear on earth, where do you think they're going to be in the spirit world? They're going to attract an environment that is very fearful to them. So, you know, if they were afraid of snakes on earth, where do you think they're going to end up in the spirit world? Does that make you sort of consider your fear of snakes a bit? <laughs> right? Because everything God does is to help you get to deal with your emotions, you see. So, so, so everything that you create, everything you're afraid of, you are going to actually at some point attract Right in the spirit state as well, in the sleep state, in the sleep state and the spirit world state. So, so you imagine passing, and all of your fears all at once are highlighted to you through your environment. So that would be pretty scary, wouldn't it? Now, if you had someone on Earth who you could connect to, even just intellectually, and hear their voice talking to them, because you don't even need to be present for that to occur. And you could hear them reassuring you, hey, actually, I know that you've parked in, passed into a fairly dark space, but what I want to do is explain to you why that's the case. And I'll explain to you how that all works. And I'll explain to you how this spirit world works. Because if, I, if you know how it works, you can change the environment in which you live by growing in your soul condition. And you can explain all that to them. 
Does that make sense? And this is what your mum needs. Your mum has come to you for some explanations. And they don't need just a, just a basic, very brief answer of go to the light because they don't know what you mean. They don't know what that means. And why would you want to go to the light anyway? Because when I, when I see the light, I look down at my body and it's got all these cracks and everything in it. I, I don't want to see them. I'd rather be in the darkness in a corner than see myself as I really am. That's how many of them feel. There's a lovely uh, channeled message um, through Hans Radix, uh, the Judas messages. And Judas himself, uh, this is the Judas who uh, betrayed me in the first century, the Judas described to Hans his own passing. And it's really worth reading because it tells you a lot about that initial part of how you go about passing. When Judas hung himself, he hung himself uh, and the, the uh, tree that he hung himself on broke and he fell to his death. Uh, he was over a cliff and he fell to his death on the bottom of the cliff. And the moment he passed, he looked down he found himself naked and had passed couldn't see much of his body and then someone come along and, and gave him some clothes so he put the clothes on and then he describes the process of what he went through the first couple of weeks or so of his passing and the first couple of weeks of his passing were basically like this he passed into a place of reception which by the way most people do pass into a place of reception and they stay in the place of reception until they want to see their own condition. Now, for some people that might take a week, for some people that's instant, other people it might take months of human time on earth for them to want to see their own condition. But generally what happens is that they're living in this sort of hospital-like environment, not like the hospitals we have on earth, they're a bit prettier and of course there's vegetation and everything in them, but um, they're quite beautiful places in comparison to what's on earth, but they're living in this environment and what they notice is that quite a lot of people come through who look very ugly, to them. And they go, oh, you know, he's looking a bit ugly. Like, geez, I can hardly look at him. He's like, oh, I wonder what he did while he was on earth. And then uh, Judas uh, found himself wanting to look at his own form. And once he looked at his own form, he was so ashamed of how he looked that he instantly recognised that he didn't belong in the place of reception anymore. And every one of the persons who go through this process, that's what happens to them. They instantly recognise they don't belong in the place of reception anymore and generally a spirit comes along and takes them to their home. For Luke, uh, so for, sorry, for um, Judas, um, if you can imagine a valley... Like you sit up on top of, say, one of these hills up here, Butterham Hill, and you imagine the valley down towards the rainforest. It's all pretty green, right? And if you get on a nice viewpoint on the hill, you can see quite a lot of valley. It just looks beautiful. You see a lot of plants and, and a lot of... Now, if you imagine all of a sudden that that valley just turns to grey and black like a fire has been through there. Have you ever seen a bushfire that's been like a really bad bushfire? like in Victoria or in South Australia you often see them, in Western Australia you often see them down south, these terrible bushfires, and they turn the whole landscape into this black and grey landscape. Well, that's where Judas lived, in a black and grey landscape for a long period of time. And he lived that time until one of the other friends of mine from the first century passed. His name was Andrew. So way after my passing, he lived in that place until Andrew visited him and started showing him how to progress. Yeah. Question over, over here, thanks, Tris. Are you in bright class? No, it's not on. Are we on? Okay. Um, so no matter what denomination or religion or what their beliefs are, they'll still go to the same reception area. And then where does... Not necessarily, because it's got nothing to do with what denomination and what religion you are. It's got everything to do with what your soul condition is. 
So the truth is you could be a Catholic, be a Catholic and actually be in a very loving condition. Right? You can also be a Catholic and be in a very terrible condition. Where do you think some of the popes, like Pope, uh, what was he, Lament, Clement and ones like that, passed in? Like Pope Clement, he began the Spanish Inquisition. You imagine where he passed? So he was a Catholic, but he wasn't in a very good state of love, and he passed deep into the hells. Other Catholics spiritually have passed into the first or second or even third spheres of the spirit world, depending on their condition. It had nothing to do with them being a Catholic. It had had everything to do with their real soul condition. Does that make sense? So some of them get received in the place of reception. Many of the ones who go to hell do get received in that way. Others who are in a brighter condition don't need to be received that way because they already know, they're already in a good condition, they're easily taught, they might be humble and so forth and they'll pass into a completely different condition and a very different life in the spirit world as a result. Does that make sense? Yeah, so not everyone that... Do you know how when you did the diagram before you said we um, start off pretty low in the... Yeah, I was, love. I was giving the average person on earth situation. Yeah, average. Yep. So would you say that most people when they pass, they pass into the first sphere or the hells? Yeah, like 99.999% of people who pass, pass into the first sphere, into the lower areas of the first sphere. Yep. Uh, so they start off here and they still slowly, some of them don't do that at all, they do that, <laughs> you know. And many of them pass into the hells in the first sphere. Very, very few people historically have passed into the second sphere. And hardly anyone at all has ever passed into the third sphere. Wow. Mm. Thank you. That's complete history of mankind. Hardly anyone at all has passed into the third sphere. Yeah. Anna, down in front. Um, AJ, in... Um, the dream state, when you visit the spirit world, mm -hmm. um, is that a reflection of your soul state wherever you go in your dream state? No. Because a lot of your dream state is about your fears and terrors and everything else being acted out. If, we, if you could draw the seven spheres like a circle and you drew sort of the seven spheres like this. Uh, I'm not drawing this very well. Uh -huh. Like an egg, uh, what's that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've done eight, but anyway. So if you draw seven spheres like that, if you picture the earth, the earth sort of sits, um, the, the, sorry, the sleep state, it sits in a sort of a state that's not a part of any of those states, but where you can visit any of those states or others of those states can visit you. So the earth at the moment you could picture is about this condition here, right? And so most of your sleep state experiences, depending on your condition, will happen in that place, whatever that place is. Um, now, for some of us, because we've learnt a lot more about the truth, in our sleep state experience is often a lot better than our earth-based experience. Uh, because we've learnt a lot of truth now, we've dealt with a lot of emotion in our sleep state that we've yet to deal with in our awake state pretty often, and so our condition in our sleep state is better, and so we have a lot of very positive experiences and lively experiences. Um, others, though, do have a lot of very negative experiences in their sleep state. This is why some of you are terrified to sleep, right? Some of you have the terror to even sleep. The reason why is because you're afraid of what happens in your sleep state experience. So you need to be willing to deal with the fear of that. Yep. But it, it varies quite a lot. There's a very good drawing, actually, in the book, uh, The Gate of Heaven, the Robert James Lee's book, The Gate of Heaven, in the actual book, there's a diagram that he's given about where the earth positions itself and it's sort of in this place where the, the, the sleep state experience encompasses many spheres and depends totally upon your condition as to where in the sleep state experience you generally reside. Does that make sense? So, yeah. So, but your dreams are often a reflection of your denied fears on earth so, if you, so they're very different to what your real sleep state experiences are. So when you go to bed and you dream about being chased around by a monster every night, well, that's a real, that's an experience that you need to go through on earth, allowing yourself to actually release the terror-based emotion that creates that 
sleep state experience or the dream state experience in this case. There's a very different thing between the dream and a sleep state experience. A dream is always about unhealed emotion. Always about unhealed emotion. Sleep state experiences are actual experiences you have while you're asleep. They're very, very different uh, in terms of their makeup and what actually happens in them. AJ, you said when people first pass over, they're offered support. They're often supported? They, they're offered support. Yes. They're offered, yes, yes, yes. And what's the nature of that support, depending on the level of where they enter into? Is that support always of the light? Um, the support they're offered is always of bright spirits, um, yes. Um, none of the dark spirits would ever enter into a venture of supporting you. So, so by nature, a dark spirit won't support you during the process of, par par of passing. A dark spirit, of course, will want to harm you in the process of passing, and many of them attempt to do that. But this is why the bright spirits around, around generally nurse you through that first process of transition. This only, of course, happens when you don't know what's happening. So when you know what's happening, the experience is very different. So when I first passed in the first century, I knew all about the spirit world. Nobody... Nobody supported me. There were a lot of people to meet me and I met up with a heap of my friends that I spoke to. But, but I didn't need to have people telling me where to go, what to do. I already knew what to do more than they did and so that there was nothing I needed to learn in the process. And I went to my home but then I went through the hills. So I actually visited all the hills and talked to all the people in the hills about the divine love and then went through the first sphere and talked to as many people as I could there. And this, all of these things happened while Mary... Uh, and, my, and my child were all asleep because when, I, when they were awake, I was uh, my child's guide. Does that make sense? So, so, but nothing, I ne didn't need to learn anything in the sleep state, in the spirit world, and so nobody supported me through the process of my passing, if you like. There were spirits there, but I knew what was happening. So basically, is what I'm hearing you saying, to surrender to that support... When we pass yes, over. if if you have that support around you, of course, because like this is a matter of it's all it's a matter of trust, you know, like the Billy Joel song, you know. I can't remember the words now, but anyway, <laughs> Mary doesn't want me to burst out in song on that one. Um, what's the, what's the line? You can't go the distance with too much resistance. Yeah, and uh, and the truth is that. You know, the more you resist the help you're given, of course, they then cannot help you. And if you're open to being to, to the assistance, it's really great because you can learn a lot in a very short period of time. And um, in the book uh, Through the Mist by Robert James Lees, um, he that was a man who part, he was on earth, very teachable and malleable. He was very loving. He, he had quite a good natural love state. He passed into the top of the first sphere uh, state. And he describes that the first, the uh, first removed from the from Earth, and he then very quickly went into a transition into the second sphere, as a result of the amount of natural love that he had as a person already. And he describes that process, if you like, of his own passing, and it's very much worth reading, uh, because it, it goes through all of the things he was taught and learned because he desired to. He was very inquisitive and so every spirit who come to help him, he just questioned him one after the other, question after question after question. And um, if you just sit down there all scared and everything and wait for somebody to tell you, then you might not get told very much, you see. But if you're, you're questioning and open and free with your questions, then you'll get told a lot. Basically, it's based on your soul condition. So, so this is where here on earth, many of you have had the opportunity to ask questions of me in these public settings, but you don't because you are afraid. Now, when you pass in the spirit world, do you think it's going to change? No. So why not get over your fear and ask the questions? <laughs> oh, yes, okay. <laughs> wow. Now that's, there's now 25 people with their hands up. This is awesome. Um, if we go up to Alex at the back there, thanks, Alex. Thanks. Um, Monique really wants to ask this question, but she's afraid. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm not um, going to answer it then. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, go. go um, Monique, do you want to ask the question? Go on. Alex decided it would be a good question, so 
Oh, yeah. oh, it's Alex's decision. Go um, on. Monique's been having um, a lot of uh, sleep state experiences of us, you know, in really blissful, beautiful experiences. Yep. Um, but that's not reflective of how we've been in our awake state. Of course. And so what's reality? Uh, both are re reality. So which is our real soul condition? Well, of course, your soul condition in your sleep state is very different to your soul condition in your awake state because of the different unhealed emotions you have in your awake state. So while you're here on earth, your soul condition is what it is right now. And when you go to sleep, your soul condition is what it is right then. And because the two different emo sets of emotions are very different to each other. See, in your sleep state, you're already aware that you can't be afraid of death. You're already aware of a lot of divine truth that you're not aware of yet in your awake state. So naturally, in your sleep state, you can be in a bit better condition, right? In the sense of you, you, there are things you trust, there are things you have faith in that you don't yet have faith in in your awake state. Right? So allow these experiences to bring your awake state into the same state as your sleep state. Mm, mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Allow yourself to trigger them. You don't need to be confused because in the end of the day, of course, if you're in your sleep state, you know death isn't real. Do, do you understand? Yeah. And you know all the people who have passed who you refuse to mourn in your awake state. Well, in your sleep state, you, do, you don't need to mourn them because they're right there next to you. Can you see the difference? Like, so there's motions that we hold on to in our awake state that we're no longer holding on to in our sleep state. And because of that, we have very different experiences in comparison between those two states. So in your sleep state, you have removed a lot of the barriers between yourselves. Right? The anger that you have with the opposite gender, for example. That barrier, a lot of that barrier has been removed because you because you know the reasons why you have it and you've tried to process some of the emotions in the sleep state. But there's awake state emotions to process too. And that's where you're refusing to process those. And I know you are trying to get into them and that's fine. But if we look at it from a, you know, the reason why our sleep state and our awake state are not the same is because we are refusing to deal with certain emotions in our awake state that we are willing to deal with in our sleep state. Many of you have far less fear in your sleep state than you do in your awake state. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Because you're a lot more conscious of what happens in your sleep state than you are in your awake state. And that's why you have less fear. So many of you, when you pass, will find it a breeze. Yeah. And it won't even be as painful an experience as you believe it to be because of some of the healed emotions that you've already processed. Now, where are all those hands again so I can pick? <laughs> okay, who haven't we had before? Let's go. If we can go to... Um, keep your hands up, don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? <laughs> we go right up the back. Thanks. Thanks, Tris. Hi, AJ. Hey. Um, the other night we were going to sleep and um, I was praying to God and Daniel said, oh, there's a spirit who wants to speak. And I said, okay, because normally I tell him time to go away. I'm going to sleep. And um, the question was like, she was watching, I was praying and she s could see that I had a really strong connection to God and a desire. And um, she, her question was, how can I have such a strong desire when my... Reality is like I don't have many possessions, and she was questioning, "How can you um, not have all the abundance in your life and still have so much desire to God?" I didn't know how to answer her, so I said, "Oh, um, my!" There were spirits around me, and they said they could help her to understand what was going on. But for my, so my question was, when I went to sleep, I was like, "I really don't know." <laughs> yep. And so I don't know because I do feel. Um, that I lack in abundance and material stuff, but I don't feel that I lack in my desire for God. Yeah, this was a good law of attraction event for you. Um, on two cases, because you did actually know the answer. Why don't you have abundance in your life? Um, I feel that I don't want it. Why? Um, 
I don't. I feel it's unloving. So you have a guilt about it. Um, I feel that, yeah, that I've got a guilt, but I also don't want to waste my time with it. Mm. How, how is having abundance a waste of your time? Um, I'm not sure. I guess I've got to go to work. Because <laughs> you think you have to work for it. You don't have to work for abundance. Oh, I don't know any other way. Uh, of course, of course. So there are whole. What you could have told her is there's a whole set of beliefs that you have that cause you to not have abundance. But you have a whole set of really positive beliefs about God, which is the reason why you have a good, strong connection with God. But there are some beliefs that you are yet to uh, feel about God, and that is that God wants you to have abundance. Well, you, you think about what God does. You like, like, we have a fruit tree, you know, we plant a fruit tree and it grows into a tree, and one, one seed produces like hundreds and hundreds of pieces of fruit this season. And then the next season, what does it do? The same thing again. And the next season, what does it do? Same thing again from one seed. All I have to do is plant a hundred seeds and now I can feed like families and families. That's abundance, isn't it? God automatically provides abundance, automatically to us. So, so if we're not having abundance in our own lives, then there must be a set of beliefs that we have, emotional beliefs that we have, that cause us to reject abundance. And one of yours is guilt. And a feeling of responsibility is another. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, but I don't understand what my responsibility would be. I, I, I mean, I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me, sorry. So you feel that, this is the feeling I feel from within you, is if you have things, then you've got to look after them. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Because huh? I used to have things, yeah, and it and took you a lot to, of effort. It took a lot of effort to look after them, did it not? Yeah, definitely. And, and now you don't want them? Because no, it takes too much effort. I don't want them because then I don't have to take any effort. But can you see if your soul was in a state where it was automatically creating the effort for you, then you would automatically have them looked after without you having to have to have effort. So it's just an unhealed emotion. The emotion of responsibility for things. And people. See, this is why a lot of you don't want to be rich. Because you don't want the responsibilities associated with being rich. Can you see that? We well, imagine what is. How many of you are happy looking after one house? You know, cleaning it, doing the toilet. You know, the bathroom. Gee, you know, it's like argument time when we've got to clean the house, isn't it? Like, we all get together, clean the house, Saturday morning, whatever, whatever it is for you. I don't know. And and how do you feel? This is tiring, annoying. Wish I didn't have to do that. Wish I had a servant. <laughs> whatever is often what we feel. And a lot of that is a feeling of not wanting to take responsibility for our life. The truth is, when you want to take responsibility for your life and you're willing to actually not feel guilt about abundance, you will attract lots of abundance. <laughs> but you already know this and you could have told her that. Because what she was confused about was, if you have God in your life, why do you, have, on the other hand, have a lack of abundance? She was confused. Can you see? And her emotions are, if you have God in your life, you should have abundance. That's her belief, which is also not necessarily accurate because having abundance is about a whole different set of emotions. Yeah. So there's a good law of attraction for both of you to work through the issue emotionally. Yeah. In the corner. Good day, AJ. Yeah, good. Um, just that the, the last question actually brought up some things in my life. I um, feel the same. I don't want abundance because with abundance comes what I believe is illusion. And a, illusion like um, having all the cars you want and all the houses and all the beautiful things around you creates problems, which in turn takes us away from, well, it creates more emotional problems as well than that. So I, I, I just related to that last question. and I, I, can, I, can I just dispel a belief system that many of you yep. seem to have? And that is, abundance doesn't create problems. Mm -hmm. Emotions create problems. You know, and negative emotional injuries create problems, not abundance. Abundance doesn't create problems. Like when, I, when I was the first person to enter the 21st sphere, I had a whole 
dimensional universe to myself. If you can just sit with that for a while, that's a lot of abundance. Yeah, it certainly is. And it didn't create any problems for me whatsoever. It was no. just, it was just happy times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then when my soulmate joined me in that place, whoa! <laughs> but it was just happy times all the time. I, I, with I, all this abundance. I, I just, I just feel to me, abundance to me is to be more connected to nature, more connected with love. Um, not cars and ab abundance in the illusional. Oh, way, I so agree. You know, yeah. I agree. Mm, yeah. But it doesn't mean you won't have physical things. No. Abundance is not like that. So, like, don't think that abundance means that, that you won't have physical things because you will. Mm -hmm. As you progress more and more and actually release the emotions you'll, uh, that repel abundance, you'll find you'll attract more and more abundance. Mm -hmm. right? But you'll use it in a manner that's part of your happy life creating for others, creating for yourself and so forth. You won't use it in an unloving manner, mm -hmm. in a need, need, grab, grab type environment. And you also won't be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. You won't be afraid of the responsibilities that come with it. Like, I, I wasn't sitting up there in the 21st sphere going, yeah, this is all too much work, you know, like... <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. It was just this beautiful place of being completely harmonious with an entire universe that was my own creation. Yeah? yeah? Okay. And, and there are many, by the way, spirits who are in the six sphere state who have had that experience too, who can create their little tiny universes in comparison, but they feel it as very abundant and they're not, they're not afraid of the responsibilities of that. You see, this is an earth-based emotion that we have. And these earth-based emotions affect us a lot, far more than what we realise. And when we pass over into the spirit world, it's that earth-based emotion that actually affects a lot of our decisions and choices that we make in the spirit world as well. Okay. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Good day. There's, there's, no, there's no one who's never asked a question before, is there yet? No? There's a lady who's never asked me a question before. Lilac Scarf. What was your name? Kerry. Kerry. I honestly don't even know what the question is. I just want to connect. Hi, AJ. Uh, this is my first time here. Nice there to are, you. thank you. Um, that and I because I haven't heard everything you've said in the past and so on. I'm I'm I have, having a little bit of fear of ignorance here. Yeah, but yep, yep. Nonetheless, I'll go. Sort of ahead. playing catch up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I guess my question that's sitting with me at the moment mm -hmm. is: I feel that I was born into my family as the firstborn of my family, mm -hmm. as a, a supposed stillborn. But my experience or imagination, I have no idea, is that he wasn't even stillborn, that he was in a place of total peace, but nonetheless wasn't um, met by my mother or my father. And I, we, we don't even know what happened to him. He wasn't buried. So that's my experience. When you say, I'm a bit confused, you're saying... I that you were, you were born into... I feel I may have been him. You feel you may have been a him. Can I explain what was actually happening? Yes. Okay. Please. Um, and this was what often happens due to false beliefs um, in, the, in the spirit world. Um, and one thing I must say is that false beliefs in the spirit world, and particularly false beliefs about their life on, in the spirit world compared to their life here on earth, cause spirits to do and attempt to do a lot of different things that they wouldn't normally do if they knew the truth. Right? But I, I feel actually that there was a, there's a spirit with you who have been with you from the time you've born, been born who tried to reincarnate using your body. Does that make sense? And, yep. and this spirit passed as a stillborn in its life on earth. And he's tried to... There's no such thing as reincarnation, actually, as, as he understands it to be, anyway. And, and he then has tried to reincarnate into a new body. And what he's done is attached himself to your body. And this is why you have strong male, um, strong male influence through the rest of your life as well. Does that make sense? Now, now, the reason why that happened is the law of attraction of your mum and dad. 
their own emotions did not protect you from this event. And it's their unhealed emotions that created the event. And it's also their unhealed emotions that need to, you need to now heal before this man will release from you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you're feeling that quite strongly as a truth anyway. So let yourself just go through that experience um, of releasing those emotions and you'll actually connect with your own femininity for the first time in your life, which will be a very powerful thing for you to connect to once you release this connection between you and he. My suggestion is to talk to him as if he is a different person to you. Talk to him as if he's the person who has has had a previous life on earth in which he didn't experience the whole lot of it and that's one of the reasons why he tried to come again by connecting to you because he feels he's missed out on a life on earth and he has some deep emotions about that and uh, and as a result of that connected with you yeah. he's confused you sexually uh, quite a lot too at times yeah yeah I've been total um, I have no idea. I mean, I'm 58 next week and I have no idea. I mean, I thought I knew what sexuality I was, but I really have no idea. Yeah. And, I'm, and it is painful and I'm sorry to cry, but... No, no, you, it, crying is welcome here, <laughs> Kerry. Crying is welcome here. And as everyone here who's been here before knows very well, <laughs> yeah, they've even seen me cry while I'm talking. Um, my, my suggestion is to allow yourself to just feel that grief that you have, that you haven't been able to connect with yourself because of this heavy influence that you've had. And let yourself work through some emotions that cause, uh, that, you know, about your parents. It's, it's parental emotions that cause the original attraction that your mum and dad have had of, um, and rather than go through them all with you, I think if you allow yourself to feel them, uh, you'll connect to them pretty rapidly, actually. But your confusion sexually is not uh, because of anything other than this man being with you 24 by 7, during, particularly during your awake hours, uh, influencing many of your choices and decisions along a masculine track. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I feel like I've, I've been mother and father to my own daughter anyway. And so I feel like I've had to be really tough and yeah. male and I just want to... Relax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you be need a fe and be feminine. Big L, yeah, big L, because that's your true nature. Obviously, that's the body you, you've uh, your soul is incarnated into. So that means you are feminine half of the soul. And while this man is overcloaking you and trying to influence you, he, he is actually causing quite a lot of damage to your life as well, unbeknown to himself, because he had a whole series of false beliefs too. So if you can talk to him about those beliefs that he has and encourage him to move on in the spirit world. He can actually have many experiences in the spirit world that he's trying to have here on earth. Does that make sense? Thank you. But, it, but, he's, but he's avoiding them, uh, wanting to ha you have a body again, basically. And can I just point out that the teaching of reincarnation and many of the subsequent related beliefs cause a lot of these kind of problems where people on earth get overcloaked from a very, very young age and stay overcloaked for a lot of their life. And, uh, and if, if spirits knew the truth, and people on earth knew the truth, they wouldn't allow these connections so much. But it's your mum and dad's emotions that allowed the connections. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what they are. Oh, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. No worries. It's six o'clock. And all is well. <laughs> it was funny, I asked the group in Brisbane, oh, do you want to stop now? No, we'll go for another quarter of an hour or whatever. And uh, then it was a quarter of an hour and then a quarter of an hour and it was half past six and seven o'clock. But uh, yeah, you need to have a rest at some point. Um, I don't need to have much of a rest now, eh? so that's fine. Um, what I would like to do is continue this discussion. So that's been part two of that, uh, the introduction to what happens when you die. Remember, we're not even yet got to the first sphere. Right? We're still in the process of discussing this process of passing. So what we want to do at another time is we'll uh, have another discussion, perhaps on one of our next uh, uh, things, which I think is September the something, uh, 26th or something. It's about a month away anyway, isn't it? Um, and I have, we do have a talk down in Brisbane on the 
19th of September as well. And uh, we'll continue this discussion though uh, as another one as part of the intro. And then once we do that, we'll have a look at life in the first sphere of the spirit world. And we'll discuss some of that. And hopefully can answer a lot of the spirits uh, in the hells questions about why they are where they are and things like that as well. Thank you again so much for your time. And I've enjoyed... And I, it's really lovely to see you're all enjoying each other's company more. Have you noticed that? Yep. That you're enjoying each other's company more and it's a really beautiful thing Your to see. Family Your family of choice is growing <laughs> and starting to connect with each other and it's beautiful to see actually. And so I'd just like to compliment you on that. Myself and Mary's plans over the next uh, three weeks or four weeks or so is uh, we're spending a week where Mary grew up in the Bunya Mountains. Um, so I haven't been there before, so that, that, that's going to be good for me. And then uh, we have a week home uh, at our fastly and rapidly changing home uh, because we have uh, uh, Russell and Katrina out there doing different things to our place while we're travelling around. And so for the first time in about six months, it's starting to get looked after a bit. <laughs> so we spend a week home and then we come back. I think we're doing a being of service on the 11th and then Mary's got a workshop and Tristan have got a workshop the weekend of the 17th. Oh. And we're talking on the 25th and 26th yeah, of September back here. So that's the plans over the next month for all of you um, who uh, want to join some of those plans. I hope you enjoy yourself doing so. Um, we're, uh, myself and Mary are just working through some pretty big soulmate type emotions still and um, to do a lot with fear about connecting for Mary and um, and many of you will find as we're working through these emotions that your relationships are in topsy-turvy mode um, so I just think I'd warn you I just wanted to warn you about that <laughs> if you haven't already noticed that then uh, you'll find that that's what's probably happening for you too and there is a whole change going on, and uh, many of you are not aware probably yet, but time uh, gets compressed every so often, and, uh, and this is a part of what the, uh, one of the Mayan calendars describe, the uh, compression of time and space. And in the compression of time, it means that many of the things that we took many years to resolve before now get resolved in months, and soon, coming up once, once uh, my own condition changes again, uh, many of the things you go through will only take days to go through emotionally. <laughs> well, just be, <laughs> just be careful about the yay. <laughs> because many of you are already confronted about having things come up one month at a time. You imagine things coming up day, every day, different things coming up. So, so it gets a bit intense, so that's the warning for you, just to, just to remember that it gets a bit intense. And that's a part of this process of the changing on the planet that is going to happen, that uh, things will get more and more intense and more and more intense until the time, the, I suppose you could call it the zero time or whatever, uh, when the Mayan calendar finishes. And then things will change into, or usher into a new place as well. And that doesn't mean that the timing is exactly the timing of that calendar, but, but things will happen in this progressive manner and uh, it's interesting that many scientists actually know about this uh, and some of those scientists have actually documented this process now and there's many scientists in the spirit world that are very keen to communicate with mediums on earth about these matters and uh, so what's happening for us uh, is that I'm typing up a series of questions for a group of mediums who want to answer those questions um, that we know and, and we'll see how those answers come up over uh, the coming months and we might post them on the internet for you as well. Just to keep you, keep you ahead of what's going on. Um, I don't think there's anything else I need to mention to you, aside from uh, you're all very beautiful people growing in love and it's great to see you growing in love. Um, for those of us uh, who would like to stick around and help tidy up afterwards, if we could just remember to have the chair, the back of the chair facing towards the front here, uh, when we and stack them ten high, then we can unpack. We can pack everything up this weekend, um, 
as Bernal. I love you guys so much, eh? And many of you, I know, have been trying to be patient, asking questions in a group. Obviously, what I'm doing is trying to feel the spirits with each of you and feel what kind of questions are there, and, and that's why I ask for certain people. So just be patient. And those of you who have never asked a question before, next time you come along, see how you go with that. Because you want to get used to asking questions. Hey, when you pass in the spirit world, you want to be question after question after question, just like a child, you know? You know what? You remember that when you were little? You'd go around following dad around and following mum around and go, what was that, Dan? Why? 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 Always why, right? And, and this is what you need to get used to again the whys and all of those things. Allow yourself to go into that process of discovery. And if you do, you'll find that you'll benefit a lot from that personally. You'll grow a lot personally. Would you like a mic? Uh, if there, I don't think there is any. Oh, yeah. Yep. AJ, I just wanted to say how um, beautiful it was seeing you and Mary up there today, really presenting together and really working together. Yeah, thank it you. It was really, really beautiful. Yeah. So. We, we will do that more as time goes on, but, but that, that part of us running together is about us joining. And, and when, when we've got blocks between us, we can't run together. Um, and this will be the same with you and your soulmates uh, as you progress. You'll find there'll be times when you're quite blocked with each other and you won't be able to stay on the same track together. But as you deal with different emotions, you'll get closer and closer and you'll be able to stay on the same track and same subjects together. And so myself and Mary are doing the being of service stuff together, which we're really enjoying. Hey, darling. And, um, and that's one of the things we've decided to do is to start doing a lot more together um, and, and start, because uh, during that place we generally, we roll off of each other a bit more as we've been going. Yeah, but thanks. Yeah, it was fantastic to see Mary flying solo too. Yeah. Go yeah. Mary. <laughs> now may I say that many of you ladies have very strong unhealed emotions about that because you want to see a woman go solo. Right? And in reality, what we're going to finish up demonstrating is the closeness of a soul union, which is both of us reflecting our soul completely, the one soul, remember, that we are. And, and many of you forget, actually, that Mary and I are not two separate beings. Many of you forget this still. And, and I can understand why you do, because we act like two separate beings at times. <laughs> and, but the reality is that we are one soul. Mary is going to be is the feminine expression of that, and myself the ma masculine expression of that one soul. And so you will not see us in competition, but rather in a merging function together. So there's a lot more that we want to talk about about that as we go through the process of rejoining again, um, then we can illustrate a lot of those things to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for your time, guys. And uh, <laughs> Have a good month. Eh? Have a good month.